So it's really great to have this uh, chance to come together uh, on a somewhat of a regular basis uh, to hear uh, the insights, the stories, and the teachings of really uh, world uh, leaders in the area of uh, compassion cultivation. And uh, it's great really to see every one of you here. And also uh, hello to everyone who's joining us through uh, Manitoba Telehealth, uh, the wonders of uh, technology. And uh, also uh, to the, due to the people working behind the scenes to make uh, this possible. And also know that uh, really these events uh, can't be possible without uh, people like you attending them. So we're really, um, we express our gratitude for that as well. So a Compassion Grand Rounds are really offered uh, through the Compassion Project uh, that is an initiative of the Catholic Health Corporation of Manitoba. And uh, the project was, really, is, was launched in June 2010, so next month it'll be uh, three years, actually. And um, when we set out to uh, launch this project in this first phase, really what we said w was that we would uh, find, create, find the creative and innovative and evidence-based ways that are known to nurture and strengthen this innate capacity that we have for compassion. And so today, I really feel like uh, we've uh, come to search the world, uh, given uh, that Dr. Robin Youngson is uh, from New Zealand. So uh, we can, uh, I think, begin to, to know that uh, we've, we've gone uh, far and wide. So Dr. Youngson and his spouse, uh, Meredith, Meredith, say hi have agreed to join us here uh, in the heart of the continent. So thank you for saying yes. <laughs> and, doc <laughs> so Dr. Youngson was a founding member of the National Quality Improvement Committee in New Zealand and was the New Zealand representative on the World Health Organization International Steering Committee for Patient Safety Solutions. And he also helped launch the WHO strategy for people at the center of healthcare in 2007. He is an honorary senior lecturer at Auckland University and is the author of a newly published book called Time to Care, How to Love Your Patients and Your Job. And the book will be available uh, after the grand round uh, for you to purchase. And more recently, uh, Robin and Meredith uh, have launched uh, what is now called Hearts in Healthcare, which is an inspirational social movement of community uh, health, or in a community of health professionals, students, patient advocates, and health leaders who champion compassionate care. And this was uh, launched uh, uh, recently. So without further ado, uh, Robin, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Micheline. That was a very uh, generous introduction. So coming all the way from New Zealand, I thought I'd bring, um, in the words of the Māori, the first people of New Zealand, some greetings and acknowledgments, and, and I'll translate to you afterwards. Ka tangi te kaka, ka tangi te kiti, ka tangi hoki o ho. Di hei mori ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou koutou, nā mihi mahana ki o koutou. E tika anā me mihi atu ki te whare e tūne ki te papa a tā koutou nei tēnā korua, tēnā korua. E nā matai, haere, 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 ki e tātou nā maroho a rātou mā tēnā rā tātou koutou. Nō reira, e rau rangatira mā, ko hui mai nei e tēnā wā Ka nui te araha mōtu ko te manua nui te te tautoko te kōpapa te rānei nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou koutou. So I began with a very ancient proverb that brings us back to the mists of the time when we're all connected and hear the voice of the kaka parrot, hear the voice of the titi mutton hear my voice also. Tihei is the first knees of life and mōri ora is the life force that flows through everything. And then greetings, greetings, thrice greetings, very warm welcomes to you all. 
I said it was appropriate to acknowledge the sacred building that stands here and the sacred land on which it's, which lies around it. To acknowledge, because we're in healthcare, the spirits of the departed, farewell, farewell, farewell. And then to come back into this room to all of us who are the survivors of the ancestors. And then to acknowledge you all as esteemed chieftains who have gathered today for this purpose and to thank you for your heartfelt commitment in support of the purpose of this work. So therefore, greetings, greetings, thrice greetings. So that's a little bit of the Māori culture and language, the first peoples of New Zealand. The, the first slide here is not the title of my lecture. It's a reflection that, that we have not flown direct from New Zealand to Winnipeg, that we've been on a longer journey. And we're connecting together lots of different groups and institutions that are part of this movement to humanize healthcare. Um, and one of the processes we're using that is really to reawaken purpose, to reconnect people back to the core values and motives and ideals that brought them into healthcare. And this is what we've been calling our, our tour, Reawakening Purpose. So the real title of my talk, and this is our granddaughter Sophie, and this is a beach 10 minutes walk from our home. This is a little town called Raglan in New Zealand. And the, the title of my talk is Saving Sophie, Who Will Heal the World for Our Grandchildren? Because here she is walking alone into a beach, into a storm, into a kind of perilous, unknown future, kind of rather alone. And if we can't do this for our grandchildren, uh, who can we do it for? And this is also a picture of Sophie. And as we travel to many countries around the world, we begin to wonder that as an industry that makes money from sickness, healthcare is bankrupting our nations. And it's hurting the people and it's wounding the, pay, the, wounding the caregivers like us. And it's really fundamentally failing in purpose. And for the sake of our grandchildren, how can we find a better way to heal the world and to heal healthcare? And when I think about the motivations that brought me into healthcare to work as a physician, you know, our true purpose is healing. And the greatest joy we have is in service. And compassion really lies at the heart of everything we do. So that's a call from Sophie, our granddaughter. So what I'd like to talk about is um, something that I didn't know at all about when I first trained as a doctor at medical school. I was trained in an ideal of clinical detachment. We were told that you needed to remain separate from your patients, not to have a connection for two reasons. The first is that if you had an emotional engagement with your patients, you would not be able to make objective decisions. And secondly, that because you were going to see your patients suffer and go through loss and see people die, that if you had an emotional connection, that that would drain you. You would have vicarious traumatization. You would not survive. And you, to protect yourself, you need to remain distant, buckle up your white coat. Um, and I'm pleased to say that that ancient traditions like Buddhism say, well, this is a ridiculous idea. And the modern neuroscience is now telling us that human beings are actually very intimately connected. When you're in a, in a personal, in an in a intimate connection with someone, it's almost as if we have a kind of Wi-Fi broadband internet connection between our nervous systems. And um, what I've learned is that the kind of spirit and thoughts and intentions that I bring into each encounter with a patient they actually start to change the structure of my patient's nervous system and to change the patient's biology in a remarkably short, even within minutes. And uh, we have in our, in our brains things called mirror neurons, which are very large, very swiftly acting neurons, which have a specialized job. And that is to recognize facial expression and to interpret the emotions or feelings behind it. And then within a mere fraction of a second, uh, we begin to interpret and intuit what people are feeling. This is part of the mechanism, the basis of empathy. So we have this, whether we like it or not, we have this profound connection. And that is causing a whole stream of biological responses which are occurring in a patient and in ourselves within a matter of minutes and hours. And genes are being up and down regulated. And when, when it's a compassionate and kind connection, we're turning on, we're upregulating wellness genes. We're causing new proteins to be synthesized. We're changing structures in the nervous system. We're sustaining and supporting tissue healing. Um, we're doing a lot of things to create positive emotions, to reduce blood pressure and stress responses. And this is really what we call a healing response. And this is very powerful. 
But if I come into a room as a physician and if I'm distracted or angry or judgmental or not making a connection, my patients don't have clinical detachment to fall back on. We still is an intimate connection, but that then becomes a wounding response. And the influence I have on a patient is to increase anxiety and fear to get stress responses to start upregulating genes that are harmful to us, to um, put up blood pressure and heart rate, to create negative emotions and emotion, negative emotional memories that, as I'm going to come on to, can be extremely harmful. So um, our daughter Chloe, nine years ago, was driving to university in a small Toyota. She crossed the center line and crashed into a large truck coming the other way. And her car was turned into one of those wreckages where you could not tell what kind of a car it is. We've, we've seen the photographs. And, and she was rushed to hospital and spent three months in hospital with a broken neck and a broken back and a number of other injuries. And we were there with her every day. And you know, to be honest, we don't remember very much at all about what was said to us in those three months. And we don't remember very much about all of the things that happened. But the things that will stay with us, absolutely forever remain, you know, deep in us are the emotional memories of those events. And when, we, so on a Monday morning, we, we got the phone call that every parent dreads. So Meredith got a phone call from the police to tell us that our daughter had been critically injured and was being rushed to hospital. I was in the OR, Meredith phoned me, and I'm sure the blood drained from my face, and I found someone to cover me, and I rushed to the hospital. And we waited for a long time in a horrible room, which was a waiting room in the trauma unit, and it was a windowless, white painted room with no comfort at all. And what was strange for me was that this was a hospital where I had worked as a senior anesthesiologist for many years. This is a really familiar place. This is a place where I felt at home, confident of my role, and yet on that day, this familiar environment became frightening and alien and horrible. And my role had changed profoundly. Now my role was the very frightened parent of a critically injured child. So we waited a long time in that horrible room, waiting to know if our daughter would survive or what her injuries were. When you feel so vulnerable and so afraid, what affects you profoundly and what you'll remember forever are the small acts of kindness and compassion. And I want to tell you about some of those. If you're a trauma victim, you make many journeys on your first day. You go from the trauma unit to the CT scanner, to the operating room, to the intensive care, backwards and forwards. And who is it that cares for you on those journeys? It's a transit care nurse. And we met this wonderful nurse, and, and he made us feel so safe because he took so much trouble and he was so sensitive and he had all of the monitoring gear and the resource drugs and all the things and the records to keep us safe. But it was his mindfulness and his thinking through, it's going to take a long time to go to the CT scanner and back, and the morphine's going to wear off. So he got extra syringes of morphine to take with him to give her PRN doses to keep her comfortable. But it's, compassion is revealed in the, in the smallest of acts of kindness. And on the journey to the CT scanner, there's a join in the floor between two buildings. And this wonderful nurse, he stopped the gurney, and he lifted each wheel individually over the joint in the floor so that our painful fractures would not be jolted. And that was nine years ago, and you can see how powerfully the memory and the emotion of that still plays out in us. And this is what happens in healthcare. Uh, the emotional memories of, of healthcare, for good or for bad, that are wounding or healing, stay with people. And that is a very powerful response. And we need to be mindful of, of what kind of experiences we're creating for people because they, they very powerfully, it's those experiences that create the biological response. Now, you know, is this nice, just touchy-feely stuff? Sure, it's nice to have patients that feel that they were cherished and cared for and, you know, build a trustworthy relationship, but does it really make a difference to how it comes? Well, I have to tell you the science is really clear on this. So what I've learned as a physician is that I have to be really careful about the thoughts and feelings and intentions that I bring to every patient encounter. Because we have so many patients that are kind of lost in the system, that have so many diagnoses on so many drugs, care that is so scattered and fragmented across so many people, that if, that if we can bring compassionate healing for the whole person, we can really help people begin to heal in that journey. So I've learned to take great care. And in healthcare, we have to move from one patient to the next. 
We're in very stressful, fraught situations. And you have in a minute to move from that patient and put all that behind you and center yourself and be mindful and be really present to the next patient as if this is the only patient in the whole world that you have to attend to um, and to be really present to that. Now I want to tell you how profound a difference that makes. This is really surprising in the, in the research in my book, Time to Care. This really surprised me how powerfully people's emotional and psychological well-being affects really important clinical outcomes and the number of studies on this and this was very surprising to me. So this is a very large study in the Netherlands, 999 survivors of heart attack, older people. And they were followed up for 15 years to find out who has a heart attack, who has a stroke, who survives, who dies. And in the course of cardiac rehab, they did a psychological evaluation, a questionnaire to find out, are these happy, optimistic, hopeful patients, or a middle group, or pessimistic, anxious patients? And the pessimistic, anxious patients, they had four times the mortality rate, 400% increase in mortality compared to the optimists. That is an astonishing difference. Because you know we're all keen and hot on evidence-based practice and making sure all of our patients are on their lipid drugs and their blood pressure drugs and all the drugs that modify cardiovascular risk. Do you know what the effect size of those most of those drugs is? About 35 to 40 percent reduction in risk. This is 400 percent. This is an effect size 10 times bigger than the best medicines we have. This is really important. We have to look after our patients' emotional, psychological well-being. We have to look after the whole patient. Here's another example. You know, it always amuses me, but medical students will do anything if you pay them money. In this study, the medical students, I kid you not, they agreed to be inoculated with influenza virus into the nasopharynx. All of them in the study. I don't know how much they paid them. But they did the same kind of psychological profiling before this. So you have happy, optimistic medical students, middle group, pessimistic medical students. The pessimistic medical students in the bottom third group, they had three times the rate of getting influenza compared to the optimists. So we spend a lot of time and energy trying to reduce hospital acquired infections, right? And what determines whether a patient gets infection? Is it because a bug floats along and lands in their surgical wound and they get infection? No. It's what is the quality of the function of their immune system. And I have to tell you that their emotional and psychological and spiritual well-being has a profound effect, like it's a difference of a threefold difference in the chance of getting an infection. So this is, you know, these, this is really important. So to summarize, there's a weight of evidence now that compassionate caring achieves much better outcomes, has much more satisfied and happy patients, is safer for patient care. You can reduce a whole pile of accidents like accidental patient falls, uh, decubitus pressure ulcers, medication errors. There was a striking study coming out of Italy about a year ago, a study of 20,000 insulin-dependent diabetics. And they tracked their hospital admissions for the next year among these diabetics. And the patients ranked their primary care physicians on their degree of empathy. So you have high empathy doctors, middle group, low empathy doctors, as rated by the patients. The patients who rated their doctors as being high in empathy they had 41% fewer admissions to hospital for diabetic coma, diabetic ketoacidosis. That's a striking reduction. When we talk to health professionals around the whole world, they say the greatest barrier to care is we just don't have time to care. We have so many tasks to do, so many patients to see, and yet the research is really clear that if you have the skills, if you invest a little time up front, if you make the human connection, that time kind of expands that the care becomes more efficient, it becomes more effective. You connect to what's really important. And there's really good research on this, even from videotaping consultations of doctors with patients. The doctors who are skilled at noticing patient cues and following up and, and making sure all their questions are answered, they have shorter consultations than the doctors that just pursue a, a strictly clinical agenda. It's quite counterintuitive. It actually reduces patient demand. So much of the demand we see from patients is because if we fail to make a connection and we only treat symptoms, we're not actually getting to the heart of the matter. We're not helping our patients to heal. And they will be endlessly dissatisfied and will endlessly keep coming back with more and more symptoms and problems. And when we make a connection and allow our patients to begin healing, then they will ask much less of us. And that's what I found in my own experience. 
and really of crucial importance, it gives back meaning to health professionals. So many of them are, are burning out. In the United States, 60% of physicians say, I would quit medicine tomorrow if I could because this is no longer rewarding work. And I will tell my children, do not follow me in a career in medicine. We have so many nurses burning out. So the evidence is really clear from the whole science of positive psychology from my own experience that when health professionals reconnect to the heart of their practice and kindness and compassion and attitudes of gratitude and appreciation, that protects them against burnout. It, re it reawakens meaning and purpose in their work. And there's, there's small evidence, but growing evidence now that compassionate caring actually costs less money. So we've, I've worked in many different hospitals in the UK and in New Zealand, and some of those have been very stressed institutions. It's the middle of winter, the flu season is upon us, the ED has got twice as many patients that are in cubicles, the hospital is completely full, the medical patients are overflowing into surgical wards, half the staff are off sick, it's chaotic, it's stressed. And yet even in those circumstances, there are some inspiring health professionals that come to work every day with a smile on their face. And they kind of got this big bubble of calm around them. It kind of moves with them wherever they go and kind of influences all the people around them. And they always find time to connect and for those acts of kindness and compassion. And the things that frustrate and irritate the heck out of the rest of us, they kind of seem to be immune to that. And they go home at the end of the day with a smile on their face, with a deep sense of satisfaction. And, you know, wouldn't you like to know their secret? Well, part of the secret is that they're very mindful of the thoughts they have on the drive to work. And in the big cities, we say, you have an extraordinary privilege, which is rush hour traffic. And you have a wonderful opportunity to be mindful about the thoughts you put in your mind. And you can spend the whole journey to work thinking how awful the traffic is and how stupid that driver was that nearly cut you off and how tired you are and how cynical and how depressed and how the patients are ungrateful and how you don't know how you're going to get through the day and you're not going to have time for lunch. And you can you know, beat yourself up with those kind of thoughts and feelings. Or you can make a choice about thinking of the extraordinary privilege of the human connections you're going to make that day. And it turns out, you know, we go to the gym and we exercise and our muscles get bigger. Well, the brain is the same. And positive and negative emotions are organized in different parts of the brain. And if we're very deliberate in practicing compassion, small acts of kindness, of gratitude and appreciation, it turns out that we grow and develop the parts of our brain associated with positive emotions like love and compassion and kindness and happiness. And we shrink the parts of the brain which has to do with anxiety and anger and being really irritated. And now we can put patients on a fun we can put subjects on a functional MRI scanner. We can actually kind of look at what is the balance of activity between these two centers and find out is this a really grumpy anesthetist, anesthesiologist, or is this someone who's kind of happy and calm and has equanimity? Um, so the people who flourish even in a broken system are those who deliberately practice small acts of kindness, of compassion. They're really kind to themselves. They have compassion for themselves. We're human beings. We're going to make errors. We're going to be faced with awful situations where we feel inadequate and feel as if we're not helping or we, we, we make errors and harm people. And if we can be kind and compassionate to ourselves, and here in the audience we have the world authority on, on self-compassion, then we tend to be less judgmental and kinder to others. So it's really important for our own well-being, but also for the care of our patients. And finding meaning and joy in service. So I've made a whole range of pretty startling claims. This is actually based on a lot of science and evidence, and it's in my book if you want to see the references. So how do we find hope in healthcare systems that can be really broken and stressed? And what Merith and I have had the extraordinary privilege of doing in different countries is going meeting with groups of health professionals and using a process of appreciative inquiry and storytelling. And we ask people to sit in pairs and interview each other. And, and the question is, tell us one day a story, a story about one day you had an extraordinary connection to a patient. And then we come back in a circle and create a sacred space and do some deep listening. And we hear the most profound, amazing, inspiring, courageous stories of compassionate caring. And the whole atmosphere in the room changes. And then added, and people see their colleagues in a different light. And we begin to, to tease out and find what are the personal strengths and the courage and the big heartedness and the kindness and the compassion that people have showed in those stories. And that, that really starts to shift 
um, our beliefs about what would be possible. And then we close the circle by saying, what is one practice that you will take to work tomorrow that would help you to make a better connection to patients or help you sustain yourself? Or what would you teach to others? So that's been a real privilege to do in the last two weeks we've been traveling, and we've done it in other countries as well. So there's a very profound sense that, that health professionals who heal themselves, who are compassionate for themselves, who find these practices of mindfulness, of making connection, of kindness, of compassion, actually they are profoundly healing their patients as well, because they bring with them a spirit and a connection that is creating a biological response. And that's of you know, profound importance. And it, for me as an anesthesiologist that started out life as an engineer and became a very technical doctor, pretty detached from my patients, it's been a wonderful journey of healing to me to find that place of finding the spirit and the human connection of my work. So I want to just shift focus a bit because Marath and I, we've been traveling around the world and writing and lecturing on about trying to put the care back in healthcare. But we were talking to some colleagues in New Zealand just recently saying, you know what? You, there's something else you're talking about, and that's putting the health back in healthcare. So, you know, what happens when healthcare just becomes like a production like, like making shoes rather than walking alongside our patients on a healing journey? And what we're seeing, even in places like New Zealand and Canada that have a socialized healthcare system, we're seeing an industrialization of healthcare processes, a focus on tasks and budgets and throughputs and production. And we're seeing the system becoming dehumanized. And we're seeing a lot of compassion, a loss of compassion. Many patients are suffering unnecessarily. Care is getting really fragmented among our different providers. Many health professionals like this nurse are burning out. The costs are getting out of control and the system's in crisis. So instead of a healthcare system that focuses on counting how many episodes of sickness care do we provide to fulfill our budgets. We need to refocus healthcare. To put the health back in healthcare, we have to have a healthcare system that focuses on building health, happiness, well-being, and resilience in our communities. Uh, things like equality and a sense of belonging and healthy lifestyles and a safe environment that can radically shift healthcare in that direction. And I want to give some examples. This is a book, The Spirit Level, published in 2009. Two renowned British researchers that have looked at what is the relationship between inequality in a country and some really important health and social outcomes. I want to talk you through this slide a little bit. So there's a scale along the bottom which is income inequality and at this end right at the top is the USA. It is the most unequal country in terms of what is the ratio between what, does the, what do the lowest paid workers earn and what do the highest paid workers earn. So if so in countries here like in Sweden in, in Scandinavia, if the average wage is $20,000 a year, the chief executive might earn $200,000 a year. There's a tenfold difference. In the USA, it might be $20 million or $200 million. And Canada is sitting right in the middle. New Zealand is doing worse. New Zealand has become much more unequal in terms of the income gap in the last 20 years. And what these researchers are showing is that there is a very close correlation across many different countries between the degree of income inequality and a lot of really important health and social outcomes like life expectancy, infant mortality, uh, murder rate, teenage pregnancies, obesity, and things like that of really profound concern. And I want to share some of the data with you. So this is just an infographic from um, the Equality Trust in the UK. And, and if you, you may not be able to see the figures, but infant mortality between the unequal countries and the equal countries, that's a threefold difference in infant mortality. There's a five-year difference in life expectancy. There is a threefold difference in the rates of obesity in whole populations. There's a five-fold difference in rates of teenage pregnancy. It makes a profound difference to how many of the people around us on the street do we trust? And in countries like um, Japan and Scandinavia, they, they, they trust 84, 85% of the people in the street around them. In the USA, half the people in the street are out to get you. And this kind of society, which is about individualism and competition and getting ahead and greed and getting, earning as much money as possible, are really driving some very important um, problems in terms of health and social outcomes. 
That's a, that's a tenfold difference in murder rate between unequal and equal countries. But this is not new knowledge at all. Uh, Plutarch said an imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and the most fatal ailment of all republics. That's in the first century BC. So I want to explore inequality a little bit. So we come from New Zealand. These are the Maori people, the indigenous people in New Zealand. This is what my patients look like. No, really, they don't come dressed like that to my consulting room. And in New Zealand, this is a country that has been colonized. So the indigenous people are at the bottom of the statistics on health, well-being, employment, educational achievements, crime, you know, you name it. And there is about a 10-year difference in the average life expectancy. And if you're of Maori descent, you live on average 10 years less than if you're of European descent in New Zealand. That's the size of the gap. At least that's what I thought the size of the gap was until you put a magnifying glass on it and really start focusing down. And in New Zealand, we have a national census system that allows us to focus down onto communities as small as 2,000 people. And I have to tell you, there's, there's a place in New Zealand, a small community, where the average life expectancy is 92 years. And there's another place in New Zealand where the average life expectancy is 62 years, not even getting to retirement. And that actually is the size of the gap of inequality. It's a 30-year gap in life expectancy, not 10. So you know, and what are the determinants of that? And how can we create a healthcare system that starts to address that? Well, Dean Ornish is the founder of the Preventive Medicine Research Institute in the USA. He's a world-renowned researcher. He's got very large numbers of publications in major journals of randomized control trials. And they are doing randomized control trials of lifestyle change. And the results are astonishing. They have done randomized control trials of patients with coronary artery disease where they've had a coronary angiogram and they've documented the stenosis. And six months of lifestyle change, and they have repeated the coronary angiogram, which is an interesting ethical committee challenge. And they've shown that the stenosis are actually beginning to dissolve away. This is reversal of coronary artery disease without drug treatment, without stents, without surgery. They've done a study of men with prostate cancer, 300 men showing a complete cessation of progression of prostate cancer and six months of lifestyle change, no increase in PSA. In those patients, they analyzed the genetic expression and they found that 350 wellness associated genes were upregulated and 150 cancer promoting genes were downregulated. Lifestyle change is profoundly changing your genetic expression. Epigenetics is much more powerful than the inheritance that you have. You know, we kind of have the idea, we have this genetic blueprint and we're kind of doomed to a breast cancer or cardiovascular disease. Your interior environment, your emotional, psychological well-being, your exterior environment, your lifestyle, profoundly change your genetic expression. And what is lifestyle change? What are the interventions I do? Just four things. The first is good diet with lots of fresh food and vegetables and low fat. The second is moderate exercise. You don't have to run marathons. You walk and cycle a bit. The third is belonging to a community that gives you a sense of belonging, a family or a community with social support. And the fourth is some kind of relaxation like yoga or meditation, those kinds of things. So, you know, when I think about, here we have the Manitoba, the, the Catholic Corporation, Health Corporation Manitoba with about 6,000 employees. And if we begin to think about, you know, what is the life expectancy of people who are at the lower end of the, the cleaners and the orderlies and the porters and the people, you know, how many of those are going to survive to retirement and what does compassion cause to do? And what if all of our lowest paid workers within this corp health corporation had access to a, a great sense of community? access every day to fresh fruit and vegetables, to live in warm insulated houses, to be able to exercise. In New Zealand, the government subsidizes the cost of insulation to poor people living in state houses. And the New Zealand Treasury has calculated that for every dollar invested in putting insulation in houses, they get five dollars back in health and social benefits. And the public health physicians have actually measured really important and significant reduction in hospital admissions and the days that kids have off school with asthma and respiratory diseases, and the, the days that the parents, low-paid workers, have off work. You know, so what if we could get all these health benefits and lifestyle changes to the poorest people that actually work within our healthcare providers? 
And that's, that may be easier than you think. In Louisville, in Kentucky, where we've just come from, flown from yesterday, one of the heroic health leaders we met, she doesn't work in a healthcare system. She works in a very poor neighborhood in West Louisville, which is called a food desert. We had never heard that term before. What does that mean? That means that there is not a single shop in that neighborhood where you can buy good quality, healthy food. Not one at all. And you can't afford the bus fare to go to a part of the community that does have it. And she is working, she's got a nonprofit called New Roots, which is helping 800 families have delivered every week a huge box of 12 different vegetables, locally grown, fresh produce. This is not charity. This food is not being given to them. They're paying for it. These poor people are putting money a week in advance into this cooperative scheme. And she goes and contracts with the farmers to, to deliver this produce. Now, they don't know what an eggplant is or a zucchini or a tomato or a, you know. So how would you, what would they know what to do with these vegetables? Well, they have renowned chefs that volunteer their time that go and cook up all these vegetables and make beautiful dishes and share it to people and get them to taste it. And they have, they print out the recipes and they have food classes. And there's a profound sense of community and it's connected to the church and the sense of mission and the people involved in this in serving you know, God's fresh fruit and vegetables from the earth to the people is you know, really profound. So she's got two of the lifestyle changes cracked already in one of the poorest communities in Louisville. And it's not charity, it's sustainable, it's growing, it's spreading. So it's not as high as you could think. So the message in this is that when we seek health in community, we find abundance. And here's a really striking example. You know, not so far from the USA, a small impoverished country called Cuba, which when the Soviet Union collapsed had a profound crisis, an oil crisis, an economic collapse. And Cuba had one of the most industrialized agriculture system with the most chemicals and, and seed crops, seed stocks and so on. And they had to change to fully sustainable organic agriculture within five years. In five years, they changed the whole system. Now, they're so poor that Cuba can only spend 1 20th of the expenditure of the USA on healthcare. And yet they have the identical life expectancy to the USA, and they have a substantially better infant mortality rate. If you're a child growing up in the USA, you have a 60% higher chance of dying in the first year of life compared to Cuba that spends 1 20th. And the message is profound. When we seek health in community as opposed to a sickness system, we find abundance. So, so what is the extent of inequality within the people who even work within the, the, the Catholic you know, Corporation of Manitoba? What does compassion call us to do to address that? And how can we role model a healthy community? Because if we as an organization of healthcare providers can't ourselves find health and well-being and role model that to the community, how can we expect our broader community to find health and well-being? So just in the way that I said that, that health professionals who heal themselves heal their patients. Healthcare provider organizations that heal themselves, they help heal the whole community. So what is Compassion calling us to do in Winnipeg? And we'd like to, to call you to create a new healthcare story that really honors of our humanity. And the work we're doing in our organization, Hearts and Healthcare, we've been trying to find ways to express the meaning of our work and the themes behind it. And we have four themes we'd like to suggest to you. The first is a theme of a restoration, of restoration our healthcare system back to, from a sickness system to a system that supports health and well-being. We'd like to put the health back in healthcare. We'd like to create healthcare organizations, institutions like hospitals that cherish and love and look after and show deep compassion and understanding to the people who work in those places so that they then can show compassion and caring to the patients. We want some human values of courageous, loving kindness, and we've heard so many inspiring stories of that in our travels. In the end, there's only one place that you can, there's only one person you can change, and that's yourself. And as Gandhi said, if we want to change the world, we have to change ourselves. It starts right here. It starts with an inner journey. So we really need to be the change we want to see. And we want to create a sense of belonging. We want to create healthcare institutions where doctors and nurses and therapists who come into the work with very high ideals of compassionate whole person care can find an institution that supports and nourishes those values, where they have a deep sense of 
shared identity and belonging and purpose, where this is a joyful place to come to work. So here's our granddaughter Sophie again. And she really wants to put our trust, she wants to put her trust in us to help heal the world and create a healthy future for her. Um, and this is our movement, Hearts in Healthcare. So please come and be part of the worldwide movement that is connecting people like yourselves together, the pioneers, the champions of compassionate caring, to create a social movement that can help change healthcare around the whole world so that we, we reduce the suffering of our patients and we lead people to heal true healing and recovery and make healthcare a great place for people to work. So thank you very much for listening so well. time for questions, uh, whether it be through uh, those of you joining us through telehealth and also the microphones. I think one is set up here, so we invite your questions that uh, you may have. And reflective science is really good too. <laughs> Thank you. So this is Kristen Neff, and the question she was asking uh, was, um, she doesn't know about healthcare, but in business, there's really good evidence that if you, if you create a compassionate organization where people kind of support each other and look after each other, are compassionate, and have a fund to help people out that have a life crisis or whatever, then that rate really makes a difference to the business, makes different businesses be more successful. And you know, what kind of programs are there within healthcare to do that? Um, the answer is that the evidence on that is really kind of diffuse. So probably the best evidence comes from magnet hospitals. So this is from the American Nurses Association. It's probably the right name of the organization. But they did research to say, well, here are hospitals that just seem to be really happy places, and, and they attract lots of really good staff, and they have low staff turnover, and their mortality rate is less than other hospitals, and they get better outcomes. And, and what are the characteristics of that, those organizations that allow them to be successful? And they call them magnet hospitals, but they kind of attract. And it's really, it's, it's lots of different levels of, you know, how do we create really great teamwork? How do we have leadership that instead of being kind of, what's the word? Um, um, instead of transactional leadership, which is all about meeting your budgets and your targets and so on, it's actually leadership about creating humanity within the organization, looking after people. Um, there's a whole pile of things you can put together that, that create a more healthy organization. Um, one of the things that I think that's really important is that the bullying and abuse and violence between healthcare professionals is really, is not epidemic, it's endemic. In every single hospital I've seen, there are very high rates of bullying and abuse. And the evidence is really clear now that this has a catastrophic impact not only on what it's like to work in that place, but it has a catastrophic impact on patient care as well, to the extent that Joint Commission in the USA now say this is a sentinel event alert, you know, which is physician, physicians behaving badly. So one of the things that we did in a hospital back in New Zealand as senior leaders was just have a policy of zero tolerance for violence, abuse, and bullying. And we actually sacked people who were technically very competent and been in their jobs in a long time whose inter behavior, interpersonal behavior was, was really um, you know, damaging. So that's, that's one of the things you have to attend to. But it's really things about um, a shared sense of purpose. I had the privilege of being part of a team that designed and built and opened a completely new acute hospital 
where one had not existed before in a disadvantaged community. And this was a completely free hospital, so this kind of tsunami of demand that, that when we opened the doors of the emergency room. And on the first day, t two weeks before we opened, we had 200 staff, doctors, nurses, therapists, clerks, cleaners, orderlies, you name it, all start their job on the same day. And we, we brought them into the organization with a, with a Maori spiritual greeting and ceremony. And then we had 10 working days to get all these people in their teams, in their wards, in their departments, everything stocked, all the teamwork sorted out, and then open the doors and accept patients. 10 days, which is a really short time. We kept 200 people together for three days because we thought that the quality of building shared understanding of purpose and relationship was so important. And I stood up with the director of nursing and we talked about how we expect you to make a contribution to serve your community. We said our mission is to make a healthy difference in our community. And we talked about four different roles. And one was the technical, kind of bring your knowledge and skills as a, as a clerk or a doctor or a nurse, the kind of thing that's in your job description you're familiar with that, that adds value through your professional expertise. But we said there are three other ways that you make a contribution. And one is through compassion and loving kindness. And we showed a film of a kind of patient that was kind of moving and engaged people. We talked about what that looked like. We talked about humility, about the ability to be quiet and still and listen and learn from someone in front of you before you kind of rush in and get busy with all your clinical interventions. And we talked about being an advocate, about helping no matter what your role is. If I'm an anesthesiologist, there are a lot of things I can do to help patients navigate their way around the system. There's nothing to do with me being an anesthesiologist. And we talked about those four things and we said, these roles are not only in respect of caring for patients, they're in respect of caring for each other. So you have two jobs. One is to care for patients, and the other is to care for all of your fellow workers to create the environment which they can make the greatest contribution. 200 people, and there was doctors sitting next to clerks and all these, and 200 people cried. They shared tears. Because they'd never in their career before come into an organization where the senior leaders just spoke about and role modeled with greater authenticity and honesty the core values of the organization and made plain that this is how we did, this is how we work. So I think, you know, there's evidence that if we really make time to talk about purpose and have a shared sense of purpose and connect that to the core values that brought people into healthcare, that's the thing that creates the happiest hospital. It's just, it's apparent to anyone that walks in the building because they're greeted by everyone who smiles and pays attention to them. And the, your staff turnover rate you know, is really low and your sickness rate is really low. So there's evidence about you know, really major impacts on those kind of sickness, staff turnover, organizational well-being, the ability of an organization to learn. So it's, so it's those kinds of things. But what we found is just attention to the smallest things. It's, it's, we're, we're not here to teach anyone how to be compassionate. The seeds of compassion are right here. What we're doing is using processes to put people in groups and to reawaken their purpose, to remind them, to, to, to find the seeds of compassion in the group through the stories that people tell, and then to ask people to say, well, we're just going to close the circle now. Tell us about one practice, one small thing as you're going to take to your work tomorrow that would make a difference. Those are the kind of processes that seem to be healing. So, but nobody in the world really knows how to do this. We're all just trying the best we can and trying to learn from each other, and that's why we're here in Winnipeg. That was kind of a long answer for a short question. Hi, I'm a director of a community health agency, and I have so many responses to what you just said. Uh, we do diabetes health, but we're in a very flat model, self-managed, and we find that that really does stimulate compassion because everyone has a say, everyone has a voice. I guess one of my questions would be for you, because the Maori are very similar to what we have here in Canada with our Native Indians. And when you talked about a 30-year gap that you had of, of longevity between 62 and 92, I was wondering if those that were still in the, the primitive tribal forms, because of that whole sense of connectedness and community and caring for one another, did not have better health outcomes than those who've become you know, the sweepers in your hospitals and the ones trying to find work. And have those studies been done? Yeah, that, that's a really profound connection. So do indigenous people with their own, their own culture, which is very different from Western culture, have in some ways better health and well-being and better outcomes? Um, okay. the, on average, the, the gap in life expectancy between Māori and non-Māori is a 10-year gap. Okay. So that's on average. So there are Māori who are 
you know, educated and have a lot of health and well-being going to live to be 100 and there are some that, you know, survive to 50 mm -hmm. or who die of morbid obesity at age 32. So the Māori have a wonderful holistic model of health and well-being and it's called um, te, te Whara Papa Tha, which is the four-sided house. And, and their health and well-being is uh, te taha tinana, which is the body, te taha hinanara, which is the mind, te taha wairo, which is the spirit, spiritual well-being, um, and te taha whānau, which is actually, whānau is the name for family or extended family. Mm -hmm. and, and that's also the name for their emotional well-being. And they don't kind of separate emotional well-being from relationship health. And in the Māori um, culture, there is, there is no concept of individual health. It, it just doesn't exist as a concept. It's the concept of health in relationship. And, and there, is, there is some profound truth that there are some Māori who actually are suffering a lot from chronic disease, you know, of, of smoking, of diabetes, of obesity, whatever, that have a spiritual health and well-being that is admirable. Um, and what's even more exciting is that in New Zealand there are a large number now of Māori health providers. So these are health services by Māori people, for Māori people, that are bringing holistic models of caring, that are achieving some amazing outcomes, um, that's in, including what I in mental health. So, so we, have, we have, when I was chairing the National Committee that advised the Command of Quality and Safety, I said, let's abandon our framework for, for quality and health care and let's just adopt the Māori model of Te Whara Papa Whā, because this would be more profoundly more helpful for us. And we nearly got there, but didn't quite. So. That yeah, answers my, my next question, which was, of good diet, moderate exercise, social support, and relaxation, which would be the most important pillar? I profoundly believe that the whole social connectedness makes a difference. And having read recently about uh, our pilgrims who arrived in Canada and survived like horrid winters, it was truly community that helped them survive. Yeah. So I thank well, you for your comments. Yeah. So what's interesting about that, in this research that in World War II in the UK, when there was, you know, profound stress on the whole country and a great deal of poverty and not enough food and everyone on food stamps and everything else, life expectancy of everyone that was left behind. So all the young fit men went off to war. The life expectancy of those left behind, the women and the children, increased very substantially during the poverty years of the war because of the sense of pulling together and, you know, a sense of community and shared purpose. So there's really striking research on that. So. I don't know which of the four. I don't know that if there's research that shows which of the four pillars, but there's evidence in support of what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our time together is coming to a close already, uh, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you, Robin, uh, for bringing really your message out uh, to the world, and you've committed to that through Hearts in Healthcare and. Uh, it continues uh, right here in the heart of the continent. So thank you. So thank you very much. It's really been a privilege to be here. I wanted to, to share uh, with you that uh, Robin uh, is uh, here for another day. Uh, as we're holding a, a small gathering uh, with uh, Robin and uh, some other uh, world renowned uh, researchers um, and thinkers in the area of compassion cultivation. So I just want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Kristen Neff, who some of you have uh, certainly crossed paths with, and Diana Camilla from the Center for Mindfulness at the University of Massachusetts. So thank you for being here uh, with us. Uh, this small gathering continues uh, tomorrow uh, with some of our uh, local influential leaders as well. So we'll see where that adventure takes us.